Good afternoon. It's two o'clock. It's the end of January and we're here. It's good to see you all again. Happy New Year, a little belated. Uh, welcome back to Florida Supernature, a uh, series devoted to the wonderful world of nature that you can find right outside your back door, coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve up here in the frozen north in Tarpon Springs. My name is James Stevenson, and I work for the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, the extension of UF right here in Pinellas County. And of course, we're a cooperative with the local government between the university and the local government providing information to the good citizens of our county and beyond on various topics, including natural resource conservation, which of course is near and dear to our hearts up here at Brooker Creek Preserve, the largest preserve in Pinellas County. Pinellas County being almost 100% built out, it's preserves like Brooker Creek and Weedon Island uh, to our south, a coastal preserve, um, as a refuge for our native plants and animals to exist the way they have for millennia in the absence of us nasty people. Today, trees, uh, Arbor Day. We had an Arbor Day, a Florida Arbor Day on January 15th. And as such, we've been celebrating all things trees this month. Our boss here at Brooker Creek Preserve is actually faculty with the University of Florida and her background is in arboriculture and dendrology, all these various studies of trees. And so we're very lucky to have that faculty right here in Pinellas County. And trees, we all get it. Trees are very, very important. They're so important that they lend their names to the primary ecosystems that are found throughout Florida, including in the uplands up here in Brooker Creek, away from the coast, uh, we have an ecosystem called the oak hammock, named after the predominance of various large oak species. Uh, we also have a, a habitat or a whole ecosystem, if you will, called the cypress swamp dominated by deciduous conifers called the cypress. So they give their name to the entire ecosystem. All the other plants and animals that are associated with this particular ecosystem, the cypress swamp. There's also a habitat called the pine flatwood. Again, the dominant plant species tree are the pine trees, uh, longleaf pine and saw palmetto uh, being the two uh, species most often associated with the pine flatwood ecosystem. So all these ecosystems, and there are plenty more, um, many, I should say, are named according to what the dominant tree species is. So we get it, trees are very important. And if you were to ask just about anyone on the street, what do we get from trees? One of the first things they're gonna say, of course, is oxygen because everyone thinks all the oxygen that we breathe come from trees. And that's okay to think that if it helps protect trees, um, it's really the blue green algae, the bacteria, but we'll let people think it's trees. Anyway, we do know that trees are responsible for quite a lot of oxygen production, just like any other green plant. But since trees are big, they get the credit. Uh, also, carbon sequestration, the ability to take carbon dioxide out of the air and through the magic of photosynthesis, knock it together with some water molecules to form sugar, now that's the magic of photosynthesis. That's the magic of plants taking atmospheric carbon dioxide, knocking it together with some hydrogen uh, from water to form hydrocarbons or carbohydrates. Does that sound familiar, carbohydrates? So trees are able to take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. 
Trees also help stabilize soils. So not only are trees helping to contribute to the creation of an organic layer of soil uh, by dropping their leaves, those that do drop their leaves once a year, uh, that helps build up that rich organic layer, the roots of the tree actually help keep the soil where it is and prevent things like erosion. Uh, and in the same vein, the presence of trees uh, can help direct the drainage of water across an ecosystem, uh, whether it be a natural system or a built system. So the placement, the presence, the absence of trees, the removal of trees can have knock-on effects for at least these three components. So living trees contributing to their to the environment in you know this small handful of ways. Also, living trees provide habitat, um, places for other organisms to live, both plants and animals. And we'll find out bacteria and fungus are important things that take habitat in trees. The production of food by trees is very important. Um, plants being at the bottom of the food chain, plants the original synthesizers, the original producers of the first rung of the food ladder, if you will, by producing you know, these wonderful, uh, juicy, full of sugar leaves, which in then turn can feed herbivorous organisms. In this case, we have a red maple leaf being chewed up by some maple leaf caterpillars. The caterpillars in turn being excellent food for birds. So the annual production of copious amounts of leaves providing food to a multitude of organisms at the very bottom and then moving on up the food chain from there. Uh, not only leaves are consumed by other organisms, but many tree species depend on their fruit being eaten for the dispersal of the seeds that lie within. Uh, an example might be acorns. The, the seeds, the acorn is actually a fruit, so the fruit of the mighty oak with the acorn has the nice little seed inside and producing, you know, buckets and buckets of these fruits, these acorns, uh, to be taken away by uh, organisms that would like to eat the seeds. The seeds, though, not having a chance at germinating once they've been eaten, but there's these critters called squirrels that take the acorns and they bury them for later. And if something happens to that squirrel and it doesn't get to go back and eat its acorn, up comes a tree. So many trees depend on other organisms to move their seeds around and the, the, uh, the trade-off there is providing some sort of food for whatever that organism might be. And of course, shelter, you know, a nice forest canopy, a nice tree canopy is, is going to provide lots of shelter for all kinds of organisms. I put another bird on a nest here because, you know, who doesn't like birds on nests? Um, living trees also host a variety of epiphytic organisms. So uh, plants and lichen and fungus all kinds of things that actually live on the branches of living trees, uh, not causing any harm, not doing any damage, uh, simply getting a foothold uh, by holding on to those living tree branches uh, with kind of modified roots that are just there to cling. Uh, in this slide, we have two species of our native air plants, the Tillandsias. They're not parasites, they're epiphytes, they're just hanging on, they want a place in the sun. Um, well, we're here to talk about dead trees and if these epiphytes were killing this tree and they fell on the ground, 
it'd be over for them. So the epiphytes, including uh, many lichen, um, are not harming their host plant. They don't want to fall down. They don't want to. They don't want their host to perish. So these aren't parasites. They're not causing any damage whatsoever. They just want to place up in the sun. So all these things depend on the living trees. And let's consider this little piece of uh, oak hammock forest right here, dominated by trees. What are these trees made of? Well, if we look back in history, uh, maybe to ninth grade biology, um, we learned hopefully along the way just what trees are made of. And even if you don't remember ninth grade biology, I bet you know what the outside of a tree is called or what that stuff on the outside of a tree is called. It's the bark, right? So we all know that trees are made of bark and inside the bark is the wood. Very good. Those two components are dead all the time. Wood isn't alive, wood is dead. Bark is dead all the time. There's this tiny, 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 thin, diaphanous, membranous layer called the cambium that is the living part of a tree. And it's this dark line in this high school biology illustration that I'm passing the little laser pointer across. Pay no attention to this arrow. It's not pointing quite far enough. It needs to be pointing to just that thin little line. And the cambium produces xylem tissue on the outside, which eventually builds up into the dead wood. So the xylem are hollow tubes that are used to transport sugars and fluids throughout the entire thing. There are ray channels where certain chemicals can be pushed towards the inside, towards the heartwood, if you will, for various reasons. Various trees have various reasons to sequester these chemicals in various parts. But generally speaking, the only living part of the tree trunk is right here around the edge, the phloem tissue that's produced towards the outside. That's the primary kind of pull the water up from the ground and send it all over the body. Anyway, that's the cambium. Together, the xylem and the phloem around the outside of the tree trunk are referred to as the cambium. And then beyond that, we've got the roots underground anchoring and drawing up the moisture and the shoots and the leaves. Um, but the point is that most of the tree is already non-living tissue. And here we have a longitudinal section and I'll send my glow in the dark pointer right there along the cambium. So towards the outside would be the phloem, just a couple cell layers thick and a couple cell layers thick on here is the xylem. And as that xylem builds up, it becomes the wood. So all this dead tissue. Wood and many, most plant parts are made at least in part of this fantastic carbohydrate called cellulose. Maybe you've heard of cellulose. Look at all these wonderful C's and O's, carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, carbohydrates, sugar, yum. Cellulose is not unique, but cellulose is um, special in that it is not soluble. It does not dissolve to the benefit of the plant, because if you were made of something that dissolves in the water, life on land would be kind of difficult. So cellulose has this wonderful characteristic of not being water soluble. Given that, it's really, really difficult to break cellulose apart. We'll look at that as we move more further into the life of a dead tree. The living tissue that skirts around the outside of the tree trunk and reaching out into the branches and shoots and leaves uh, has amazing healing capabilities. 
So if a tree is somehow wounded, it needs to regrow tissues to protect that inner tissue. So here we have a tree that is healing a wound, healing its own wound by changing its uh, primary modus operandi uh, from transporting water and nutrient throughout to, to uh, focusing more on uh, producing tissues that will seal a wound, uh, harden towards the outside, re-establish that waterproof barrier to the outside. Uh, trees have to be very, very careful about protecting that precious thin layer of conductive tissue. Any uh, assault on that delicate thin layer on that cambium, any assault on that cambium becomes a point of weakness. It can become a point of infection. And despite the fact that cellulose, all this wood being made of cellulose and very difficult to break down, it doesn't mean that there aren't organisms that can. So trees have to be very, very cautious, cautious, I don't think that's the right word, but um, able to heal their own wounds. Also in this slide, we have these lichen spreading over the surface, um, harmless, as we mentioned before. This is just an organism that wants to be out in the sun, has no idea where it's going or growing, and it just happens to have uh, found a place to grow on this tree bark, and it's beginning to cover up, is having zero effect on the plant. It's a combination of all different organisms, uh, the lichen is. Uh, we will send a link to some other webinars that we have recorded, an entire webinar on lichen, if you want to um, have a nice snooze on that. Trees do not need that internal wooden structure, that old xylem that's turned into wood. It's not necessary. It certainly, of course, helps to support the tree. But in the absence, should something actually breach, broach, breach, um, through and make its way into the heart of the tree and begin to break down all that wood on the inside. It doesn't, it's not curtains for the tree, it's not the end. All that wood could disappear and the tree could stay standing. And there's a, a middle school science experiment where you take a cylinder and you take a solid rod and it's much more difficult to bend and break the cylinder than it is to bend and break the solid rod. So a hollow tree could be a cylinder that could actually be much stronger with the absence of that internal wood structure. So again, the business of conducting water and nutrient is happening around the cambium and that can continue in the absence of the wood inside. In fact, the oldest tree in the world um, is thought to be this uh, bristle cone. And you can see it's got all this gone dead, but there's this thinnest of slivers of cambium that is still supporting its associated branches and shoots uh, still living after close to 5,000 years. So it's really, really hard to kill a tree. They're built to last, they're made to last. But we all know that there are such a thing as dead trees because we've seen them. So eventually something happens that brings a tree to the end 
of its life. And what happens after that is what we'll be exploring for the rest of the presentation. But what could possibly kill a tree? We're talking about this thing that's lived there for 5,000 years. Surely there have been organisms that have tried to get that tree. Well, there are a lot of factors, a lot of environmental factors, a lot of biological factors. I, I say it quite often, it's not Snow White out there in the forest, in the woods, in the great outdoors. It's not everything in, in peaceful harmony. It might be an equilibrium, but it's still pretty much dog eat cat, eat plant, eat mouse, eat grain, eat fun, everything. It's prey, eat or be eaten. But what's after trees? Well, environmental factors, of course, something that can't be prevented and can't be avoided if you're a sedentary 80 foot tall tree, you certainly can't avoid a lightning strike. And lightning, of course, would be attracted to a tall object, the tallest object around. And perhaps you've seen lightning strike a tree, or perhaps you've seen the after effects. And electricity and water having their very special relationship and plants being 98% water uh, could certainly boil off after being struck by lightning could certainly boil all the water inside. Um, lightning, depending on how it acts, could simply blow out one whole side of a tree, uh, can split trees in half. There's all kind of uh, ramifications of the effects of lightning, not always fatal. In fact, often not fatal because of that wonderful ability of trees to heal themselves. So here we have a pine tree that's been struck and pine trees are very often struck by lightning. Um, and you can see the damage that has been wrought by the lightning strike. But that cambium is going to start producing reactionary tissues to seal up anything that might be exposed to the elements, to seal off any point of infection um, or access to that uh, precious cargo that the vascular tissue is carrying around the plant. So nice try, Lightning. You could might have killed the tree, but this tree's probably survived that. Other environmental factors that can bring a tree to an untimely end might be, you know, severe weather. And here we have what is probably a laurel oak uh, coming to more or less an untimely end uh, with the arrival of very, very strong winds. And so winds twisting, turning, overwhelming the kind of natural uh, flexibility of the wood fiber tissues uh, and eventually breaking them up. Now, we do see some pretty serious breaks of uh, these main limbs. Uh, certainly small branches have been ripped off, um, but the cambium seems to be intact. We don't have a completely encircling uh, disposal of the cambium layer. So there's still um, a chance for water and nutrient to be passed even out to these straggly, straggly survivors. But look at the size of the points of infection. Uh, this tissue, the cambium that's been exposed by the break in this large bit of tree and you know, here we have death by a million cuts. All these small branches that have come out have produced these points of infection. And if the tree can't quickly overwhelm and seal off these points of infection, uh, they could become themselves overwhelmed uh, with pathogens that could do the tree in. Other severe weather might just be the weight of snow. And again, this might not be a really serious 
you know, life threatening injury to this tree, but it's a nice long point of infection for the introduction of some sort of pathogen or some other organism that might be then able to get in and get a foothold. Other sources uh, that can break through a tree's normal defense our forest friend, the pileated woodpecker, uh, in their everyday activities of pecking away at tree bark, looking for what's underneath, looking for grubs, um, they can introduce points of infection that could overwhelm a tree's natural defense and lead to its untimely end. We'll revisit uh, woodpecker a little bit later. There's another bird called a, a yellow-bellied sapsucker that intentionally reaches the cambium. Upon reaching the cambium by making these little uh, woodpecks, um, the cambium begins to leak sugar. All the sugar that the leaves have produced that's on its way to be put away or used by other cells for growth begins to leak out. And so you got this nice sweet sap syrup, if you will, leaking out, uh, which attracts insects. The insects, of course, then are fed on by the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Now, the sapsucker depends on living trees for this. It's not a good idea to kill your host, because if you kill your host, the syrup shop is going to close. So the efforts of a yellow-bellied sapsucker shouldn't be fatal. But again, if you combine wind damage, lightning damage, woodpecker damage, yellow-bellied sapsucker damage, you're beginning to give the tree a little bit more than it can handle. And this combination of stressors could eventually overwhelm a tree and bring its end. There are deadly fungus. We're going to talk more about fungus. Um, most fungus wait until after the tree is dead to get to work. There are certain species that will actually um, kind of take the lead on bringing the trees down. Uh, one of those are the conchs, uh, these perennial uh, bracket fungi, uh, the action of this particular fungus can bring death to the tree. Other organisms um, play a secondary role. Dutch elm disease is a fungal disease that clogs up the cambium and shuts the cambium down. And once the cambium is shut down, game over. Uh, the fungus associated with Dutch elm disease is carried by a beetle. And the beetle makes these crazy looking tunnels underneath the bark uh, near the cambium where it plants the fungus. The fungus takes over the cambium and the beetle feeds on that fungus. That'll kill a tree. So we have a tree that's weakened by storms, by lightning, uh, by woodpecker holes, um, then we get a pathogen like the Dutch elm disease fungus. You can see how these things can add up. There's another disease, laurel wilt, which has found its way now to central Florida. It first appeared in the mid-Atlantic, I think in the 80s or 90s, uh, not that, really not that long ago, but it, it's, a, it's an imported disease, an imported fungus, imported beetle, uh, just like the Dutch elm. It's a beetle that carries a lunchbox full of yummy fungus, flies to a new tree, plants the fungus. Fungus grows through the cambium and kills the host plant while the beetles live large on their fungus farm. Laurel wilt affects our red bay. Um, one of our native laurels, um, it 
also affects one of our native laurels that is economically very important called the avocado. Nobody really cared that the Red Bay was getting wiped out, but now that it's in a economically incredibly important crop, we're doing some research on how we might go into battle with this little critter about the size of a grain of rice, maybe even smaller. Maybe if you can imagine half a grain of rice uh, would be this little um, beetle that carries the fungus that clogs up the cambium, that kills the tree, that blah de blah. And finally, if all these natural and if all these natural forces and stressors weren't enough, people, even very, very well meaning people, um, expect quite a lot out of trees and very well-meaning people put a tree in the parking lot and then put a parking lot on its roots and then put a thing around it. And how hard can it be? Let's just put a tree right here. It'll be great. We'll have a big tree. It'll be a great big tree. It'll make some shade. Except when we go in and chop the tops out for no real reason. Anyway, trees, parking lots, not a good mix. Uh, here we have a homeowner who has been told to mulch. Mulch conserves water, builds up the soil. It's a great thing. But I noticed when I mulch, it kind of decays and washes away. So I'm just going to do this once. I'm going to put all the mulch that I have underneath this tree. So I only have to do it once. Deadly. Piling up mulch around the bottom of this tree is going to produce the dead tree and all the life associated with it. And finally, humans can create their own points of infection, intentionally, unintentionally. Driving a nail into a tree, you know, backing into a tree, whoops. So all these combination of stressors can bring the demise of a tree. And the one that I left out is old age. Certain species only get to be so old. I mean, nothing that we know of yet lives forever. And so at some point, being a living organism, a tree is going to come to the end of its natural life and simply give up. So between natural environmental forces, introduced or native insect and fungal species, and the acts of human beings, a combination of stresses can lead us to a condition called dead. And what good is a dead tree? Well, this is one of our pine trees um, slash pine, I think, up here at Brooker. It's kind of hard to tell when it's dead um, up here at Brooker. Um, you can see that even right upon death, when we noticed it had seized operations by losing its last needles, it's no longer photosynthesizing became a lookout uh, for what we have here, this red-shouldered hawk. So giving tree is still giving, even though it is dead as. Once a tree has completely lost its ability to defend itself, in come the primary decomposers. Those organisms which took advantage of the first land organisms. So plants and fungus figured out how they could live outside of the ocean and live on land, you know, millions of years ago and started to take over all this wonderful real estate and coming to the end of their lives, that's free food. 
So certain organisms came along and had to overcome that magic cellulose, that cellulose that allows for land plants because it is insoluble, figured out how to take these down. And these would be the organisms as simple as bacteria and fungus. So bacteria belonging to a kingdom of life all their own, the fungus belonging to a kingdom of life all their own, um, each independently figured out how to overwhelm and take apart this energy rich molecule called cellulose for their own advantage. So the bacteria figured it out, the fungus figured it out. Uh, they both developed independently these enzymes. Remember enzymes? Enzymes that can break apart carbohydrates. That's what we want. We want enzymes to break apart these complex carbohydrates, these complex sugars, uh, these starches, the cellulose uh, into manageable pieces that can be consumed or can be used by other organisms to build, you know, start over again, you know, take the Lego castle apart and build a tree fort out of the same bricks. So these enzymes that the fungus produces and that the bacteria produces can reduce a big tree made of cellulose into its component parts. And those component parts by other organisms at the microscopic level can be built up and fed on again by other creatures beyond the um, basis of the food chain. So we got the primary decomposers at work here. We've got a lot of bacteria swarming in. They're gonna start munching away at the cellulose. They're gonna start breaking down the tree. Um, with every bit of rot that happens, that exposes more surface area of the decaying wood. And that exposed surface area produces some real estate for more decomposers to attach to. And exponentially, the primary decomposers can spread throughout and their action of decomposing produces surface area that the decomposition can continue and so on and so on. But now we've got a nice big colony of bacteria feeding on some dead tree that might get the attention of a giant amoeba called a slime mold. It's not a fungus. It's actually a another kingdom, yet another kingdom. So we've got bacteria, we got fungus. Now we got the amoebas coming in. Uh, this giant macroscopic amoeba called slime mold. It can search and find and look and spread and envelop the bacteria that were just minding their business eating tree cellulose. Then here comes the uh, physarum that comes and absorbs and eats and carries on and grows um, one after another. And this slide, I want you to look closely. This bit down here, these white filaments, we're gonna meet them again because even as this organism, it's moving kind of northwest. It's heading up this bit of trunk. And these are the oldest bits left behind. This is where the, the organism had been. And this white fuzz is actually a fungus coming in and finishing off the back end of the slime mold. I'm telling you, it ain't Snow White. Eventually the slime mold needs to reproduce and so it 
bundles up special tissues and sends spores out into the atmosphere um, to drift on the breeze and hopefully find a place where there's another rotting tree that's attracted a lot of bacteria that the next generation of slime mold can feed on. The fungus, the true fungus, um, we don't get to see very much. We get to see the fruiting body. We get to see when the fungus is expressing itself and producing the spores that it's gonna to use to reproduce. But for the majority of its life, fungus exists as that hazy, filmy, fibrous mass that we saw attacking the slime mold. This is what fungus is made of. These hollow tubes, microscopic, thin, hollow tubes. This is how fungus spends most of its life. When it's time to reproduce, it takes these little strands and it knits billions of them together into that familiar mushroom shape. So if you were to, if you happen to have a, a mushroom in your refrigerator or the next time you have a mushroom on your plate, if you need to be discreet, that's fine. Uh, just pull it open. And you can see that it's actually made of these very, very tightly, tightly packed fibers. And those fibers represent the main growing component of the fungus, the bit that lives within whatever it's eating. Those tubes, those filaments, those strands, they're called hyphae. H Y P H A E. And they branch and grow, and the little nucleus splits, and they can fork, and they can so on and so on. They, they make pretty much a network of these hollow tubes. But they're not animals, and they're not plants. They're not animals. They don't swallow food. They're not plants. They don't make food. They're fungus. They've got their own way of being they actually secrete digestive enzymes. Remember those that we just met, the xylase and the lignase and all those, those enzymes, they actually release them into their environment, breaking down the xylem and the lignin and all those other bits of cellulose and reabsorbs them in a way that they can, in a way that they can absorb. They digest and then external digestion and then they reabsorb. So in a lab, this is what hyphae looks like. A mass of hyphae is called a network of mycelium. Big words, don't worry too much about them. I'm just, it's, I'm just telling you what's what. So the fungus growing through its substrate, digesting as it goes, breaking down its environment. If it, eventually it's gonna run out of fuel or some environmental, environmental something is gonna trigger that we've done all the work we can do here. We need to send our offspring out into the wind because there's probably not much left to ingest. And that's when we get to see the fungus. That's when we get to see all that hyphae knitted together into the reproductive structures. And fungus is a fantastic, amazing kingdom of life. Again, it's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's not a bacteria, it's a fungus, it's its own thing. And we've never found the name for this particular fungus. We came across it up here at Brooker on a dead log. Uh, we just named it the molten lava fungus. That's good enough. It might not be known to science, might need to be investigated. But anyway, uh, this is the reproductive expression of this fungus, which had spent all of its life growing underneath, decomposing, reabsorbing, changing the cellulose, into a more accessible, um, more accessible components of that complex molecule. 
the molten lava fungus, I think that'll do. We're pretty sure that this yellow one is called the earth tongue spathularia, maybe. Again, underneath the bark here would be the decay, <clears throat> excuse me, the decaying wood that this fungus has been feeding on for the majority of its life. And now it's expressing its reproductive phase. With it, this kind of pale sage green organism is another species of lichen. Lichen is a self-contained unit. Lichen does not decompose the surface it's on. It doesn't decompose anything. It's a producer. Lichen has within its tissues photosynthetic organisms. So it's a closed system. The photosynthetic organisms take the carbon dioxide and the water and smash them together and make sugar. That's what's happening inside of a lichen. All it wants from whatever surface it's growing on is a place in the sun. So the photosynthetic organism can take advantage of that. Continuing on our little fungal foray on our dead tree, we have the jelly fungus. Now the jelly fungus comes in a little late to the fungal follies. The jelly fungus shows up to parasitize other fungus. So we've got, let's just say for the sake of argument, we've got our molten lava fungus, whatever it is, busy digesting, decomposing, externally digesting the cellulose, <clears throat> the wood, the lignin, the bark, everything, just breaking down all that good, let's not go to waste plant materials. And along come the spores of this thing. And instead of digesting the wood, this critter starts to digest the fungus, its neighbor, and it's dissolving the tissues of that first fungus and reabsorbing all the good that that fungus had done so that what it has just finished dissolving might not live to reproductive age. Uh, Tremella might end the life of a fellow fungus growing around on a dead tree. Jelly fungus having fed all it wanted to on its neighboring fungus then produces its reproductive structure, which is white and gelatinous. Has anybody asked if I can eat it yet? That's what the, everyone wants to know if you can eat fungus. I don't, I always say no, just don't, just don't, just don't. Um, we met Ganoderma a little earlier. Remember the big shiny conch? That's what Ganoderma even means. It means shiny skin. Uh, but this Ganoderma conch, this is the reproductive structure of that species of fungus that can actually kill a living tree. So now it's gone and done its thing. It's killed its living tree. And these Ganoderma conchs, these brackets, can live years and years and years and years until all of its resources are exhausted. And then it shuts down, but let's not put anything to waste. You can see there is what looks like a bread mold fungus growing all over the surface of this Ganoderma conch. So nothing is wasted. We've got a dead tree. It got killed by Ganoderma. The Ganoderma went and dissolved all of its wood came up, reproduced, sent spores out to kill another tree. Then another species of fungus came in. Just a peek into the world of fungus there. So fungus, bacteria being among the primary decomposers once a tree is gone, moving in 
taking over all that wonderful real estate, um, creating the surface area to allow for the exponential growth of more decomposers, the presence of water, even though cellulose is insoluble, water is still very important for these decomposition organisms, the bacteria and the fungus alike, to, you know, do their thing. And so adding surface area by decomposing also allows more moisture, more water to enter into this decomposition system and speed things along. And along comes Mr. Squirrel, who comes and takes the mushroom and eats it. That's okay. Because remember, the majority, the majority of the fungus is living in the substrate. Don't even see it. It's underneath where he's standing. He's standing on a dead tree here. And all the fungus is growing all through the inside. That little mushroom that poked out, that's only the reproductive structure. That's only a part of it. It's like picking an apple off a tree. You're not harming the tree. You're just taking the reproductive structure and, and running away with it. So squirrel here, munching on a mushroom, having that funny little look in his eyes. Another, and that brings us to kind of our next layer of the demise of a mighty oak. And that would be this group of insects, which are perfectly suited to destroy. They're the beetles. And even before the Ganoderma can get going in its reproductive phase, even before the Ganoderma can make the conch, the shiny, the shiny skin conch that here got overwhelmed by uh, a bread mold species, we get these beetles that come in and start eating that fruiting body. We, uh, these beetles come in, uh, they're called the pleasing fungus beetles. I didn't make it up, I wish I had, uh, but they're actually referred to as the pleasing fungus beetles and that's what they eat. And they can clamber all over each other and everything and get all the sustenance they need. Um, they're moving up the food chain. They are taking biomass from a primary decomposer. So there's no photosynthesis happening here. There's no, you know, the, the bottom of the food tree died when the tree died, but all that carbohydrate that the tree had spent its life making in the form of wood, bark, and so on, the fungus is now converted into fungus tissue. And now the beetles are converting that into beetle tissue. And eventually the beetles will become amorous and make more beetles. So we have this phase of a dead tree getting us another leg further along the food chain. There's a group of beetles. We have the pleasing fungus beetles are a group of beetle. We have another group of beetles called the longhorn beetles. They don't have horns. They have antenna that they use to pick up environmental cues and helps them find each other. Uh, the adults feed on nectar, but their larvae are wood consumers, dead wood consumers. So the longhorn beetles include this flower beetle, um, this red longhorn beetle, this red flower longhorn beetle. Um, here we have it walking around on the outside of a dead tree because it's looking for a place, she's looking for a place to lay her eggs because the larva can and do munch through dead wood. And they need high humidity in order to get through. Now, as hard and insoluble as wood and cellulose is, the presence of water, the presence of moisture, the presence of humidity and heat are going to allow 
the fibers, the tissues to loosen up just enough for these larvae of the longhorn beetle to get purchase with their little chewing mouth parts. So these larvae of the longhorn beetles, they can chew through wood, they're safe in there. Think about how much nutrition is packed into this grub. So they've hidden themselves inside this wooden sarcophagus so nothing can get them until they're metamorphosized into the adult beetle uh, with those really strong and hard protective uh, outer wings so they don't tear when they climb out and they can fly off and make another round of flower beetles. So we have our grubs protected inside this wood and they're eating the wood. They have microbes. They have our, they have our friends, the bacteria that make the xylase and the lignase in their gut uh, in the, the bacteria that can decompose wood are in the guts of this larva so that the larva can process that wood. And the larva think they're safe inside the wood because nothing can get them because they're inside wood. And along comes the giant click beetle that has these fake eye spots. Those are not its real eyeballs. It would like you to think it were because that would make it seem that much larger so that you might leave it alone. Um, the giant click beetle also lays its eggs in dying wood and its larva can walk around in dying wood. But the click beetle, the eyed click beetle, the giant click beetle, it chooses to lay its eggs where there's already some tunnels, which means there's already some larva of another beetle, of the longhorn beetles. And this beetle's larva tracks them down and eats them. I told you it's not Snow White. Another of the wood boring beetles, the boring beetles, which are not boring at all, obviously. Uh, best beetle or the Pasilis beetles. Um, we call these the patent leather beetles. They're dark and shiny. Beetles are really, really, really well adapted to life in dead trees. They've got this hard exoskeleton that all insects have, but theirs is particularly hardened. Uh, they can, they're smooth. They can slip through passages that they have used these giganto mouth parts to chew. So these beetles don't feed on wood. They just excavate tunnels throughout the wood. And those tunnels, surface area, decomposers, everything's happening to eventually bring the mighty oak down to dust. But in the meantime, these organisms taking full advantage of that. Uh, the Pasilis beetles you can see here on close up, they have, these are very, very uh, armored, uh, protected against being scraped or scratched. Um, they can take quite a lot of lateral pressure. Um, should something shift in their rotting log and they get squished a little bit, they can, they're kind of dorsoventrally flattened so they can kind of squeeze out and, and keep moving. They live in colonies. They actually look after their young. So you can get an entire family of these large beetles. Did we have a hand for scale? Yes, we have a hand for scale. So these things, you know, they're a big, a big fat inch long and about half that wide. Um, so they're not small. They could use these wood chewing mandibles to hurt you. It's not their objective. It's not why the pinchers are there. You kind of have to want to get pinched by one of these. Um, they do have to protect themselves somehow, right? Another one of these pre-adapted organisms, the beetles that have found their way into decaying wood is our largest beetle. And that's the Hercules beetle. Uh, these horns 
on the mail, those aren't for getting, those aren't for navigating through wood. Um, that chore is only done by the larva. Uh, these horns in the Hercules beetle, they're just for mating, not for mating, but uh, they, um, they're, uh, they fight with them. They fight over ladies with the horns and then go from there. Um, beetles, here's a schematic look at a beetle face on the left here. They have mouth parts that are modified to chew back and forth, chomp, 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 chomp. And here's a beetle larva up close. We saw some before. They're colorless, they live underground, they're thin skinned. Um, they would burn up if they were exposed. They're nutrient dense. Um, a lot of people like to eat grubs because they're so nutrient dense, but certainly a lot of other organisms have found ways to discover and extract grubs from the dead wood that they're living in. Uh, but the grub of the Hercules beetle, no, actually this is one of the best beetles. It doesn't matter which one it is, um, chewing its way through the dead wood. Other borers are pine beetles. And there are many species of what are called pine bark beetles or pine beetles. Um, they're a major agricultural pest because pine is grown as a crop. Pine trees are grown as a crop, as a timber crop. Um, they have the same mechanism of carrying their fungus lunchbox from one tree to another and then planting the fungus in the cambium where it overwhelms the cambium and starves the tree. Um, evidence of these things are called um, popcorns. There's a fact sheet on this group of organisms because they're so economically important. Uh, Julius just put it in the chat. So if you'd like to learn more about um, the pine beetles, you could learn there, but they can bring down a pine. So been struck by lightning, been mulched too deep, and then in come the pine beetles. It just gets overwhelmed and we end up with a dead tree and all these agents of decomposition. The pine beetle, uh, when they run around underneath amongst the cambium of the pine tree, they make these kind of uh, sigmoid channels. They're about, again, the size of a grain of rice or smaller. And the martini is here to remind me to tell you that they're attracted to alcohol. I'm not joking. The beetles are attracted to alcohol because alcohol is one of the first synthates or the first products, byproducts of decomposition, of natural decomposition. Fermentation. Um, so fermentation begins to happen as a tree is dying and alcohol is just naturally produced. The beetles can pick, pick up on that and they can go to a tree that's already in decline because it's gonna be that much easier to overwhelm. It's already compromised. So the beetle can plant its fungus. The fungus can grow really, really fast. The beetle can eat its fill uh, all before the tree finally perishes. For more information on that, there's another link uh, to this booklet. If you really want to nerd out on the ambrosia beetles and the bark beetles, these are the ones that um, get, up, get up in the wood for whatever reason. Um, and help reduce, if they don't kill the tree, they're certainly helping to re reduce its viability. Another insect, moving away from the beetles now, we have the carpenter ants. Um, people think they're termites. They're not even closely related, the ants and the termites. They just have similar lifestyles. Uh, they live in colonies and occasionally they produce winged individuals, uh, but they belong to two very, the, um, the ants 
are bees and wasps and ants. The termites are roaches and mantids, roaches, mantis, and termites. So two different groups there. Uh, the carpenter ants, the adults can chew through the wood. They're not eating it. They're just making a habitat. Carpenter ants are carnivorous. They're active at night. They eat dead bugs. They love dead bugs. They find dead bugs and they bring the dead bugs and back to the colony that's in the wooden structure, uh, tear it up and feed it to the babies and each other. That's the carpenter ant party. Um, they can become a pest because they do create these chambers, these uh, yeah, chambers and tunnels in wooden structures. And those wooden structures can include human made, man made, human made structures. I mentioned the termites and I have a video. We found, we came across some termites and let me see if I can get this to go. I don't know if I can. Here we go. Here we have a non-winged termite and all around it, sorry about the, there's the, the feeding termite. Again, it's going to have that same bacteria in its gut that's going to allow it to um, decompose whatever it's chewing. So the termite needs to have the bacteria in its gut so that it can digest this stuff. And here we have more of the reproductive phase. So these aren't the eaters these are the reproducers. So when it's time to make a new termite colony, uh, this colony has produced the winged phase. And they're off to find, <clears throat> excuse me, some dead wood. Get it? You get it. That flight of termites in turn coming out of a dead tree is going to feed carnivorous insects. So the termites produce thousands of winged individuals, hoping that maybe one will survive to start a new colony. The rest are kind of offered up. Their energy is then reabsorbed and moved up the food chain. So other insects and birds, everybody, everybody now, dead trees and birds. Here we finally got there. So we've got the primary decomposers, we move up through the fungus to the beetles, and we've got the chambers happening and the decomposition happening and the ants making their way in and the termites and they're eating and these things, the ants and the termites, they make the winged forms that are then food for the vertebrates, the birds. And we have birds that can take advantage of those wood boring grubs. The termites that are taking flight, uh, the carpenter ants that are just trying to, you know, make a colony or two. But our favorite vertebrate when it comes to dead trees is the pileated woodpecker. Now we saw earlier the picture on the right of the pileated woodpecker um, just going after the grubs, just flicking under the bark, hoping to find something behind the bark that it can eat. Woodpeckers, pileated woodpeckers, can excavate nesting cavities for themselves, and they do. And here we have the one on the right, which that's her, that's the female. She is inspecting this nesting cavity that was created by the male who's on the left. You see his red mustache there, and she doesn't have one there, so she's checking out the nest cavity and if she likes it she'll put her eggs in there if she doesn't like it he's got to make another one um, but nothing goes to waste study of woodpeckers their diet is primarily carpenter ants so remember the carpenter ants that are getting into the wood they're used they're not eating it they're just making that's what the that's what the woodpeckers are looking for when they're flicking at bark 
They make at least one new cavity every year, and they've made themselves quite happy around people. There will be, in our series that's just starting up uh, for 2021, we're going to do a whole thing on woodpeckers. So I'll just leave woodpeckers there for now. Once the hole is excavated by the pileated woodpecker, that produces a cavity for other species that are cavity nesters, like the screech owl, looking very much like a dead tree on purpose. Um, Julia got this picture. Um, tree cavities are prime real estate. There are certain species of birds and some mammals that will only nest in a tree cavity. And it's only a, there are only a very few species that can create those cavities the way that the pileated woodpecker can. This is a very upset flicker. It's a type of woodpecker. It's more of an ant pecker. Uh, they spend most of their time on the ground eating ants um, that has found a cavity in a palm tree. The cavity was already occupied by a starling and the red, excuse me, the yellow shape right in here is the sharp offending beak of the starling taking issue with the flicker trying to move in on that cherished tree cavity. So how can we help? prevent such an outrage. Well, since we've taken all the trees out of Pinellas County, pretty much, 98% of them anyway, um, let's put back. Uh, here is a list of species that rely, at least either rely, depend, or will use tree cavities. We can create artificial tree cavities in the form of these nesting boxes. So here's a list of birds that can benefit by human-made nesting boxes. We'll put up a, fact, a link to a fact sheet on what those species are uh, and how to create various uh, nesting boxes to accommodate the various species because they're going to want different you know, shapes and sizes and heights and all these other things. So take note. Um, other organisms, in particular, the non-native imported Eurasian honeybee loves a cavity. And in my limited experience with nest boxes, I have successfully provided habitat for non-native imported Eurasian honeybees. They provide food for something else, I suppose. Anyway, link to the uh, cavity nesters in Florida. Check the chat for that. So where are we going to find dead trees? Where are we going to find all this great stuff happening? Well, that's kind of hard, right? Um, here's a picture of our beautiful county. And here's Weedon Island. And it's got a tree cover. And here's Brooker Creek Preserve, and it's got tree cover. And there's not much, there's really not much tree cover anywhere else. So where are we going to get the dead trees that are going to start this whole decomposition, food chain, slime mold everything system we can help with that we're going to find the dead trees and preserves we're going to look to our university of florida ifas extension florida friendly landscaping trademark program to help educate ourselves and more importantly, gentle, positive education for our neighbors 
and perhaps homeowners associations, if you are so ill yoked as to have a homeowners association. Because one of the tenets of Florida friendly landscaping is providing habitat for wildlife. And you can, you can define wildlife to suit your own needs, really. You can mention butterflies and you can mention birds and leave it there. You don't have to talk about the fact that you're going to bring snakes and raccoons and spiders and, and wasps and all the wonderful things that are crucial to a healthy ecosystem, especially one that's contrived like a yard. Um, talk about wildlife, talk about attracting wildlife, talk about the importance of, look here, dead trees. They're referred to as snags and leaving snags. And here we have Many birds use snags for perching, nesting, and feeding. Um, native bees, these are the buzzwords, pardon the pun, um, that you can use to get your friends and neighbors and homeowners associations on board. Everyone loves birds. You're not gonna hopefully find a bird hater. So providing dead trees is a benefit for birds. Leave it there. Leave the part about the deadly fungus and the slime mold and all that. That's that's just for you to know. That's the cool stuff. Um, but leaving dead trees, hopefully you've seen through today's presentation, the host of organisms and the complexity of the process of decomposition and how each step along the way leads to this mesh of healthy ecosystem and a healthy environment for wildlife and humans alike. So hopefully that was the intent of today's presentation. I hope I got close. I'd love to answer some questions. I can see out of the corner of my eye that there's some um, questions popping up in the chat and the Q&A and I love that and I'll do my very, very, very best, I promise. I won't make anything up. Um, but Julia first is going to launch a poll question. It's one of the things that we have to do because we are the University of Florida. We need to gather that information. So hopefully there'll be a small percentage of y'all that can um, uh, answer the questions on this poll. And off we go. So as soon as, I don't know, 50, 70% of y'all have weighed in, uh, Julia's going to close the poll down. And once that's done, uh, we'll get to these. I'll start reviewing the questions now. So I'm just going to go quiet here for a minute. Thank you, everyone. We're going to leave the poll up for about 15 more seconds. We've got about 70% of you voting, so we very much appreciate that. And then we'll pull it down and get to questions. Okay, I'm going to end the polling. And we will turn it back over to James. Thank you for this information. Thanks for contributing to the poll. Of course, um, we always appreciate your feedback. It definitely uh, informs how we develop our programs, how we present the programs, how we preserve and, and rebroadcast and so on. So just a few questions I would like to address. Um, Charlotte has heard that there is something affecting our palm trees, and there is something affecting our palm trees. Um, it's a disease, a pathogen. Um, it, there's more than one. 
Uh, number one, our native palm trees are in pretty good shape. Our native saw palmettos and cabbage palms are in pretty good shape. Unfortunately, there is a disease that affects the, uh, the vascular system of, I believe it's the Canary Island date palm that has now hopped into our cabbage palm. And research is ongoing on how we're going to address that. It's extremely difficult to battle pathogens as an invasive species. Invasive pathogens, are, we're right in the middle of it right now, aren't we, as, as human beings, but as, as invasive weeds are much easier to control. And even then it's an uphill battle. Uh, but yes, there is a disease that has been imported that is beginning to affect our native cabbage palms. Can we put, and Charlotte, can we put paint to protect our trees uh, from infection? That is um, certainly uh, has been promoted in the past, uh, putting the black paint, um, a special, what's called a sealant uh, on a tree uh, to prevent that infection. Uh, trees are really best left to their own devices. Um, if a tree is going to be pruned, uh, it's important to study up on how to properly prune a tree because trees are very, very, very well capable of sealing up their own wounds in their own way and adding a foreign substance, a petrochemical, something like that, that could interfere with the, the natural healing process. If a tree's defense system is going to get overwhelmed, it just is. Um, is there an edible beetle grub in Central West Florida? I bet there is. I'm the wrong person to ask. We'll have to put that one. I bet they're all edible. You know, I think grubs are very nutrient dense. Um, I don't know that there's any that are being farmed to that level, you know, where there's enough grubs that are being produced. Like, I don't think you can make a living or a nutritional, nutritionally satisfactory outing. Anyway, so the longhorns, no, they don't. The long, Nicole wants to know if the longhorns kill the tree. Um, no, the, the longhorn larva, they eat the wood, uh, but that wood on a standing tree, on a live, the wood in a live tree is very likely to be um, in a state that is too hard for the larva to get through. The larvae are going to prefer a tree that has fallen, uh, that has be already begun the process of decomposition. Um, it's not the longhorn, longhorn beetle larvae themselves that are going to contribute directly to the death of the tree. All right. I've really appreciated spending 23 extra minutes with you. Um, Thanks again for joining us today. I've got on this screen uh, the next four Wednesday webinars. Uh, we're going back to Bugs and Butterflies. That presentation has been revisited. So if you've seen it in the past, um, hopefully you will rejoin us and see the updated version. Same also with The Life of Lichen. Uh, Lara and I actually had Life of Lichen published uh, as, um, as a fact sheet, and we'll make sure that you get a link to that if you join us for Life of Lichen. A departure will focus on that one particular group of birds, the woodpeckers, in mid-February. Uh, we'll look more detail about what makes a woodpecker a woodpecker. Um, another new-ish presentation is plant poison. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention today about trees in life is their ability to fend off infection by the production of antibiotics. I don't, I'm not even going to air quote. I don't know why I did that. I don't need air quotes because they're real antibiotics. They're antifungal, antibacterial compounds that most plants produce because they're stuck standing still. The poisons that plants produce and how we have taken advantage of those. Um, join us. BrookerCreekPreserve.org, 
You can see a list of upcoming classes in the descriptions uh, and the chance to register. Always through Facebook, our Brooker Creek Environmental Education Center. I'll leave my email address up for a second uh, if you want to drop me a note or a question that you might not have wanted to ask in uh, in the chat or in the Q and A. Uh, otherwise, I will let you go. I've gone on too long already. I appreciate you joining us today. It's very good to see you all, and hope to see you very soon. Thank you.